First talk of the conference, welcome everyone. Uh, just a reminder for the people of Zoom, on Zoom to keep uh, your mute uh, in mute, just in case. Uh, our first speaker is Jennifer Van Zede. She's an assistant professor at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. And she's gonna tell us about, uh, give us an overview of the 1D stellar evolutionary models. So welcome, Jen, and take it away. Thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me better now? Okay, good. I'm gonna try to keep my voice low because I can't breathe through my mask. So if you can't hear me, tell me and we'll ask, see if we get the mic higher. Okay, so I have been tasked with the tall order of talking to you all about 1D stellar evolution models. And so I think the appropriate thing is to start with some disclaimers. Uh, I work on stars like the sun, pers personally. That is what I do. Hold on, this is not working. There we go. So I work on stars like the sun. Uh, occasionally, I will creep up the main sequence. Occasionally, I'll visit the lower main sequence. Sometimes I leave the main sequence. But for the most part, I work on sun-like stars. And so this talk is going to be biased by that background. Um, but for a talk that is 9 AM on the first day of the conference, it's perhaps not a bad thing to talk about the bedrock of 1D evolution modeling, which is the sun. Right? What pieces go into modeling a sun-like star that every stellar evolution code and every stellar model cares about. So that is this perspective that I'm coming at you from. When I miss a piece of massive star modeling or low mass star modeling that you'd really like to talk about, interrupt me or, or talk about it during the question session and discussion. I'm only here as an as a, uh, instigator of conversation, basically. The second disclaimer, it's not working is to forgive me <laughs> when I don't cite you. So this is, um, this is an enormous field. Uh, and basically, every sentence I'm going to say has probably about 10 citations that should be attached to it. And rather than covering my slides in those citations, uh, I have decided to keep it cleaner. Right. So I will show you some plots. I will cite the paper that that plot came from. I've chosen that plot because I think it's a particularly nice way to back up what I'm saying but it is not meant to be an exhaustive literature review. I'm very cognizant, cognizant of the fact that there are people in this room who have been working on this longer than I've been alive. People in this room have, who have much deeper knowledge of these individual topics than I do. So please feel free, free to add your wisdom and nuggets through, to this as we go through this talk. Okay, disclaimers aside. So we take a star and we say we can accurately model this thing as a one-dimensional object. So you take a sync line from the surface, you drop it to the center, you read off the structure of variables, you solve the equations of stellar structure, and that describes your star. This is actually remarkably good approximation. Stellar models are, have been very, very successful. Right? We modified the standard model of particle physics because the solar model, which was one-dimensional, non-rotating, non-magnetic, said the neutrino flux from the center needs to be this. Right? Uh, the sun is good is a sphere to a part in 10 to the 5, right? It is very spherical. And although you can point to clear dependence on rotation, mixing, if you look at light elements, you see that there's more subtle things going on. In terms of what it actually does to the structure, 1D is mostly good enough for the sun. Now, there are some places where it is obvious that a 1D approach is not a good one. Convection is a very, very clear picture of this, right? This is an intrinsically 3D process that operates in a star. We need some way of parameterizing convection. The way we do it now is, you know, workable, but probably not the best, right? That's an example. Magnetic fields are intrinsically 3D. Mass loss is an intrinsically 3D process, right? So there are these places where the dimensionality matters. And what we hope we can do is to find an appropriate way of collapsing that dimensionality, of saying this is the average effect of this 3D thing on a 1D model, and we can incorporate it into our 1D models. 1D models are with us to stay for the foreseeable future because they are blazing fast, and they allow us to make contact with the observations. Right? What we see in nature is a bunch of stars at many different ages and evolutionary states that span billions of years. You need models that can get you that kind of reach. Right? And the hope is, is that when you have something like convection, for example, which operates on time scales that are very short in comparison to the nuclear evolution, you can separate those problems treat the 3D problem in all its 3D glory, and find a way to incorporate that into a 1D model. OK. I also think it's important to couch this entire discussion in the context of observations. 
because the reality is our models are only as good as the observations that we use to test them. And if you look in the literature today, these are the kinds of numbers that people are reporting for the standard observables. This is not fancy stuff like magnetic fields, rotation, light element abundances, all this, right? This is just the standard things we measure. Temperatures, quoted temperatures, precisions, not accuracies necessary, of 10 to 100 degrees Kelvin for effective temperature, a few percent in radius and luminosity, and 0.01 to 0.1 dux in surface iron abundance, right? Anybody that has spent significant time working on 1D models will be very uncomfortable by the left-hand side of this because you know that if you change anything, your model moves by that much, right? So one of the main challenges for this field of 1D modeling is how do we go from something where people are giving us numbers like this to translate it into a way to map to physically what is going on in stars? How do you make that mapping? How do you do it well enough? How do you make the models fine enough to take advantage of what we actually have available? And this is a you know last five to 10 years revolution kind of thing that is fundamentally changed the way we need to approach stellar modeling. All right, I am gonna show you a very few handful of cases that once you have pictures like this, you start to see things. So this is a plot that I think is particularly nice for showing one of these cases. This is a bunch of red giants that have measured astroseismic masses. We know they're all about the same mass. The tracks in the background are computed with a fairly standard set of input physics. There's nothing fancy there. It's very vanilla. Um, the, they all have apogee spectroscopy, so the metallicities and temperatures are measured. And if the models are doing a good job, what you should see is that the color of the point is the same as the color of the track behind it. And you see that this is not the case, right? The tracks are spread. There's a differential stretch between what the models are saying and what nature is saying. And in the literature, people talk about this being maybe something to do with convective efficiency, a problem with boundary conditions, something insidious like apogee temperature errors, right? But there's a, a tension here that needs to be resolved. If you're looking for places where there's routinely tension, going to the lower main sequence is a great place. The models break routinely there. Um, this is the open, sorry, globular cluster, 47 tuck. It's low metallicity, old system has beautiful HST data. So you're seeing this in a color magnitude di diagram from HST. The white curve represents what happens when you take standard set of input physics from solar type stars and extrapolate them down to the lower main sequence. This is like magnitudes of difference, right? It's very distinctly not what stars are doing. The yellow curve is when these authors said, okay, let's go back and make sure that our mapping from the thing that comes from the model, which is luminosity, to the thing we measure, which is a color and a band pass, is good. Gets you a little bit of the way there. The purple is if you say, okay, let's go back and revisit stellar atmosphere models to make sure our boundary condition is done really carefully. Gets you closer. The blue is saying, oh, well, we're gonna do it empirically. It's an empirical calibration of that boundary condition. It does a beautiful job of reproducing it across all different kinds of stars, but it is not because you've managed to get it from first principles, it's because you said, okay, nature is telling me this is what it is, I'll calibrate it because I need something to use, but the physics is still in a place where it's not getting you what you want, right? So this is, it's an obvious place where we have improvements to make. Okay, another place, right, is so what I've done here is I've pulled from these groups of isochrone producers uh, so uh, this is a track of constant time, but varying mass for a two billion year old population. Uh, this is for solar metallicity for each of them. And this is 100 degree uncertainty, 10% luminosity uncertainty, right? These tracks are in different places in a way that should be measurable, right? And this is both a problem and an opportunity. It's a problem because we now have measurements that are good enough to tell the difference between these, right? And some of these are probably better prescriptions than others. It's an opportunity because now we can tell the difference between those prescriptions. So every one of these teams has spent an inordinate amount of time being careful about the ingredients that went into these models. This is not haphazard. Every one of these tracks has had a lot of thought and care put into it, but different but reasonable choices of the physics can get you this much shift, right? So that's the kind of challenge that we face as 1D modelers. Okay, so 
we make a bunch of choices when we run any 1D model. And looking at the rest of the schedule for this conference, right, we're going to have discussions about convection, discussions about angular momentum transport, 3D modeling, all these different places, right? And so I think what might be most useful to talk about now, at the beginning of the conference, is what goes into the most vanilla, most standard, non-magnetic, non-rotating, solar-like model of a star. What are the uncertainties there? What things do we do? How do we, how do we approach the various problems that we've encountered in doing this? And what kind of wiggle room do we still have, even in that extremely simple vanilla case? OK, so there's lots of stuff that goes in. And every time you run a stellar model, you make these choices, whether you realize it or not. Right? So in something like Mesa that has beautiful abilities to take defaults, right? even if you don't necessarily specify which set of nuclear reaction rates you want to use, there is one chosen for you, right? So every single evolution code incorporates these pieces. And I'm going to go through and step very briefly through a bunch of them. I'm going to linger a little bit longer on the things that I think we're less likely to touch in the later discussions, just to give a more rounded approach. All right, so boundary conditions, right? You have a system of differential equations subject to a central and surface boundary condition. The center is trivial, the surface is not. What people do is generally one of two approaches. They say, OK, I will set my boundary at the photosphere, so an optical depth of tau equals 2 thirds, or maybe something a little bit deeper, depending on the stellar structure that makes it most appropriate to do the matching. And you can either take a, a full atmosphere model that gives you the relationship between optical depth, pressure, and temperature to get that boundary condition, or you can use an analytic t tau relation to get you the temperature and then integrate an atmosphere above it, right? The first option takes into account the full glory of atmospheres and radiative transport in them, allows you to account for surface gravity, metallicity, both of which should be important. The second option doesn't, but it allows you to easily get the structure in the atmosphere. So seismologists will usually take the second because they need that structure in order to calculate pulsations. So these boundary conditions can matter. This is for the red giant branch. 100 degree temperature are different choices of boundary condition. The white one is one of these atmosphere tables. The colored ones are these analytic approaches. For cool stars like this, you probably should be using the atmosphere table. But if you're a seismologist and you need that structure that doesn't come from the tables, you're probably not using the atmosphere table, right? And it matters on the level of the measurements we can make, right? Something to keep in mind. This, is, this problem becomes important generally for cool stars. All right, another is the equation of state, right? The sun's interior is actually remarkably close to an ideal gas, but it has important uh, departures from it. As you go to more exotic regions of the HR diagram, those departures get more serious. I've pulled from the 2019 Mesa paper, their equation of state uh, plot. Every one of these sets of letters represents a different published equation of state. They all make various assumptions and treat certain physical processes that are important for that range of density and temperature. They are not all applicable everywhere. Overplotted here are tracks of the interior properties of a white dwarf and a 25 solar mass star. You can say that they span some of these different equation of state ranges. Right, so what you have to be very careful of is the, the ramping between them. The Mesa folks are, most codes that have a ramp between equation of states spend a lot of time being very careful about how you do that. This is a choice, and you don't have many of them. So there's not many equations of states that you can swap in and out. There's, there's a couple. There's like two or three that you might see people switch in and out. Um, but this goes into every code, and it's, it is important for specifying exactly what the structure does. So this is another place where you have an input. You don't have much flexibility in that input, but it impacts your answers. All right. Another, which is particularly important for, for cool stars, particularly today, where we make the measurements that we make, is diffusion, gravitational settling. And then if you're looking at more massive things that have higher luminosities, you can have radiative lev levitation as well. So if you have a star that has a gravitational potential, heavy things have a tendency very slowly over time to sink with respect to light things. Right? So you have a tendency to have your metals settle out, helium settle out, hydrogen go to the surface. If you have an extremely strong background, uh, radiative background, right? You can actually have that radiation interact with some of those heavy things and push them back up. 
in a sun-like star. Uh, this is a plot that I think makes this point beautifully. This is models for low mass stars. So here you don't have to worry about the levitation, but you do have to worry about the settling. Settling is a slow process, it takes billions of years to really make, a, really make an impact. But what you're seeing here is the blue represents things at about age of the universe, yellow represents things at age of the sun. Uh, notice that the scale on the y-axis is of the same order or larger than the quoted uncertainties in F upon H. This means that if you're going to be using those extremely precise measurements to try to map you into a particular composition and mass domain, you don't incorporate this, you get it wrong, right, systematically. Now, this is one of these places in 1D codes that we, uh, even if they're non-rotating, sometimes we, we include a little bit for rotation, right? So if you do this for, you'll notice this stops at 1.4. Above 1.4, that surface convection zone is very, very thin. You get into a place where you, you just drain it of metals. They're just gone, right? Which A, we don't see in nature, and B, causes codes to kind of choke a bit. So what people will do is they'll often just turn it off up here. Actually not a bad assumption because those stars in nature are rapidly rotating. Any kind of rotation and mixing will undo this very slow effect. Even when you're doing this in the case of the sun, sometimes what you'll see people do is the sun's measured abundance of helium in the convective envelope is basically close to the primordial value, even though the sun's total helium is a few percent higher than that. And that's a settling effect. You can calibrate, you can, these diffusion coefficients are tabulated by people in this room. Uh, you, can, you can modify those diffusion coefficients to fit what you see, at least in the sun, where you have measurements. And that's another tactic that people take to basically incorporate some past rotational mixing into a 1D model that doesn't know anything about rotation. All right. Overshooting and convective boundary mixing. I have the feeling we're going to talk about this a lot, and so I have spent very little time in this talk on it. I picked this particular range of ages because, you know, the difference between these hooks has a lot to do with how you treat your convective boundaries, right? Any, in these places, in these particular stars, any extra mixing at the boundary is providing extra fuel to the core, it extends the lifetime of the star, and it has, it gives you a very different looking track when you include it versus when you don't. When you go and you look at advanced stages of evolution, the details of when you allow overshooting to happen, where overshoot happens, how much happens, the profile of how it happens can really dramatically affect what you predict should happen on the HR diagram. I'm not going to touch it. There's so many experts in this room. I think we're going to have plenty of time to talk about it later. But this is an important thing, an assumption that goes into models. You will see people that work on the solar side of things just never turn, diffu never turn overshooting on because they don't want to deal with it. And people that work on more massive stars spend a lot of time worrying over what you should assume about the overshooting or convective boundary mixing, as we're calling it these days. OK, nuclear reaction rates. This is another place where you don't actually have that many options to choose from. There are a couple of well-known compilations that you can choose. You make choices both about the rates that you assume and the network that you track, right? So the more elements you track in a nuclear reaction network, the more expensive the computation is. Things like a solar mass model will run with a very lean network because it makes things faster, but as you go to more massive stars, you can't get away with that, right? There's much more complicated networks that need to be accounted for. Even in the case of the sun, you will see in papers that people adopt some compilation, but then they swap out the rate for nitrogen-14 to oxygen-15 burning. This is the rate-limiting step in the CNO cycle. Uh, there's been major revisions to its astrophysical cross-section in the last decade, decade and a half. Right? It's important. Any star whose nuclear energy generation comes from CNO cycle really cares about that rate, and there's uncertainty in it. You will see different groups make different choices about which measurement of that rate they choose. All right, opacities. This is another place where most evolution codes are ingesting some tabulated table that tells you how opaque stellar matter is. This is a necessary ingredient in every code. And it gives me an opportunity to talk about a fun and ongoing problem with solar models, which is the solar oxygen problem. So the story of this goes is in the late 90s, Gravesen Saval published a compilation of abundances that included the net 
mass fraction of metals in the sun and oxygen. The helioseismologists took that compilation, ran it. You have a full sound speed profile, almost a full sound speed profile for the sun from helioseismology. They run a model with this compilation of abundances. And that's what this plot is showing. So this is the, as a function of position in the sun, how much of a departure in the sound speed profile is there between the model and the helioseismic inversion. The old abundances are these guys here. So you can see it's not perfect, there's structure there. This is probably mixing that's needed, uh, but it does all right. In the early 2000s, Martin Asplund and company did a more careful job of treating the complexity of measuring oxygen in the solar atmosphere. It's got non-LTE effects in some lines, it's heavily blended in others, it's actually quite a pain to deal with. This more careful treatment lowered the oxygen abundance by 40%, 40%, right? Big number. And because oxygen is a very important metal in the sun, it's the most abundant, right? It lowered the total oxygen, the total metal fraction in the sun significantly as well. When you run models of the sun with this new abundance, the sound speed difference gets very large in comparison. This is not small in comparison to the airs. This is like tens of sigma discrepant. And the thing that's causing this is that in this model with low oxygen, oxygen is the primary opacity source at the base of the convection zone. So if you change the oxygen, you lower the opacity, the convection zone shallows, and you end up with the convection zone in the wrong place by many sigma. Okay. People have spent this, there was a flurry of papers in the early 2000s about this, and it is still not a solved problem, right? There's a beautiful review by Sarbani Bazu that's like 100 pages of what people tried to do to solve this and, and failed to solve the problem. So there's kind of two directions we see out of this. One of those directions is to say, well, these new measurements of the oxygen are still not correct. And recent oxygen public, publications of the oxygen abundance have been creeping upwards towards this older value. They're still not there, they're like halfway in between, but they're not as, they're not as low as these early uh, publications. The other way out, another way out, there's many ways out, but another likely way out is that the opacities are wrong. Right, so this is, most of the time the opacities you use in a stellar model are a calculation. They're a model of what opacity should be that's tabulated and handed off to you to be put into a model and used. This is an experiment with the Z-Pinch machine at Sandia to actually bring material up to stellar, uh, the, the temperatures and densities at the stellar convection zone. In 2015, they published iron. The blue curve that's a little hard to see is what one of these uh, opacity tables would have predicted for the iron opacity. The white is what it is measured. It's higher. It's not enough to undo the solar oxygen problem. Remember, iron is also an important opacity source, but it gets you part of the way there. Now they repeated the experiment with other metals, chromium and nickel, and found actually the OP opacities are pretty fine for those. So it's really uncertain what's, what this means. Maybe it really is that iron is just weird in comparison to these and there's some missing piece of that model that gets iron wrong. Could be a problem with the experiment, it's not clear. Right? But either way, there's a big uncertainty here that is, is kind of staring at us from this problem, which is, Either the opacities are wrong, and all the opacities you're using in your models need to be adjusted. And if you're somebody that cares, you know, about iron opacity for the iron opacity bump, right, you might be concerned if the iron opacity is not right. Or the, the number we think of as the solar Z, or Z upon H, is not the number it should be. And every model is scaled to the wrong bulk abundance, right? So this kind of like detailed calibration thing ends up mattering. Okay, I want to talk about these last two kind of together um, in connection with this idea of doing a solar calibration. So what is a solar calibration? A solar cal is saying, okay, we've got some parameters in our problem that we don't know what their value should be, and they, we're going to use them to tune. So you set your set of input physics. You say, I've made all these choices. I'm going to run a solar model out to a solar age, make sure I get the radius and the luminosity right to high precision that I get the surface abundance right to high precision. That's the most basic solar calibration. If you wanted to be a little bit more complicated about it, you can say, well, let me also get the helium and the convection zone right, or let me try to match the sound speed profile. There's many ways you can do this, but it all boils down to the same basic process. If you're working on a star that is not the sun, and you really are not 
go on a calibrate for the sun, you can find another group of stars who you think you know them well enough and use them as your calibration source, but you still generally do this process in some way. For the sun, the two free parameters are the initial helium abundance and this alpha. Alpha is the mixing length alpha, so it describes the efficiency of convection. It doesn't really matter very much. In a deep stellar interior, you're not particularly sensitive to this choice of alpha, but near the surface in the super adiabatic region where convection is inefficient, alpha matters. And as you move it, you change your radius. So alpha messes with your radius, helium messes with your luminosity. You tune these guys until you basically get to the right spot. Now, there's a theoretical evidence from 3D simulations and empirical ev evidence from observations in astro seismology that this guy is probably dependent on surface gravity, temperature, metallicity, mass. What people have done historically and still often do today is do this calibration and then apply it to their entire grid, right? Probably not the right thing to do. Experts in the room on this topic, again, we will probably talk about it later this week in great detail. Because we will probably talk a little bit less about helium, let me just also point out that if you're running a grid of models, right, you calibrate, you get the solar helium. But then let's say you actually want to study a star that's plus 0.5 dex in metallicity. Helium is really hard to measure in low mass stars. So what we usually end up doing is we set a helium enrichment law where dy dz is some number, which can be close to one or 1 1.5, right? And it's that metals and helium are produced together through stellar evolution. So they should increase in lockstep. Some people will say, okay, this is the calibrated sun. This is primordial. I'll draw a line between them and use that. There are other lines of evidence for the helium abundance that will, will have some people choose other slopes to this. But this goes into it and helium matters. It shifts you around. It's something that's hard to measure, right? So that's another baked in piece of your assumptions here. Okay, so my point in showing you all of these places where you should be careful is not to be discouraging, but rather to impress upon you that we come into this problem where we'd like to do a better job, a better treatment of things with all of this baggage, right? These things are there. We may be able to get rid of them as time goes on because we are able to look at very fine-grained observations of stars and say, no, some choices are better than others and we will use those. But this comes with us in every endeavor in the future to incorporate magnetic fields, better mixing, better convection, all has to touch with this. So with that in mind, let me give you some of my ideas for ways you might move forward on this. Um, I think we should all jump on the astroseismic bandwagon. Like this is, you, you can see in the history of studies of the sun, how revolutionary helioseismology was. It completely changed the game, right? And it actually caused an update in a whole bunch of different ingredients, like the opacity tables were updated because the helioseismic observations disagreed with the opacities that were being used, right? We are now able to do this for other stars. Uh, it's already caused a revolution in the way that we study stars. I think it's not over yet. We should, as a community, I would argue, try to get pulsation spectra on literally every star we possibly can, because this is an incredibly powerful window into the interior that is better than almost any observation, I would argue, for probing what's going on in 1D models. Now, it is the case that some stars, M dwarfs in particular, are probably not going to be detected in pulsations anytime soon. We're not completely lost, right? Because we have Gaia, and Gaia does fantastic things for us. So this is a nice, again, a nice compilation of an idea, a plot that really demonstrates this well. So this is imagining that you have an open cluster system, same age, different masses, same composition and you're trying to fit an isochrome to it. And each panel is wiggling one of the parameters of the problem, right? The age is an obvious one that you would wiggle. This is extinction to the cluster. That one's uncertain. F upon H that you measure, also uncertain. This is like the level of diffusion, right? Initial helium abundance, overshooting, parameter, mixing length, right? And you can see that each of these has relatively subtle effects on the shape of this. But those subtle effects are different in different portions of the HR diagram, and there is some ability to tell the difference between one or the other. This tiny little gray dot is Gaia end of mission uh, precisions, inflated by a factor of 10, so you can see it. 
Uh, and this is, this larger dot is uh, uncertainty in the photometric zero point uh, that's, that's, that's kicking you here. Uh, so I think we have, like, there's a lot of very careful work to be done, but the path of that careful work is pretty clear. We have it in front of us, basically what we need, and we just have to put the time and the energy into doing that careful work, mimicking the careful work that's been done for the sun in the past in other systems. All right, another place where I think we can, we can really make progress is to keep our eyes out for kind of smoking gun signatures of something, right? Something, you have some physical process in a star that you want to study, and it has some clear, very distinct signature that shows up only under very limited situations, that if you see it, you can say, ah, I've got it, right? That is that, and I need to be able to match it. So I'm going to take speaker's prerogative here and talk about something a little bit close to my own heart, which is uh, we, uh, almost 10 years ago, found that models close to the fully convective boundary were doing this weird thing. So low, low, door, low mass M dwarf stars had these like wiggles and hitches, right? And the first look at this was like, Ooh, okay, <laughs> that can't be good. But it's actually a real thing in the models. What's going on is these things are very, very close to fully convective, but not fully convective yet. They have a thick envelope, and they actually have a convective core. They're burning helium-3 in the core, but they're actually producing, uh, the, it's, it's non-equilibrium helium-3 burning. It's actually net producing helium-3. So as time goes on, the amount of helium-3 in the core builds up. The amount of burning of helium-3 goes up. Those convection zones touch, mix. Now the core helium-3 goes back down, right? So it resets to envelope radiative zone core, does it again. Helium-3 increases, mixes, resets, and it does this a couple of times until the helium-3 abundance rises to the point where the star is fully convective forever. It happens over an incredibly narrow mass range, like a hundredth of a solar mass, right? It's, it's two very close convection zones, so you might worry about your convective treatment, overshooting, all this stuff, right? Very, very touchy thing. Gaia came along. And lo and behold, there is a feature. We were not super optimistic that <laughs> we were ever going to see this, right? It's pretty subtle. Gaia came along. There's a feature there. This is the Gaia CMD. I've literally only cut on parallax. I haven't done any other quality cuts here. And it's, there it is. And earlier this year, Greg Fyden published a paper where he was careful to track this and did a population synthesis and found that there it is, right? Shows up there. And it is from that feature. It's in the wrong place. It shifted a little bit. You'll notice the main sequence is also in the wrong place because we're talking about M dwarfs and it usually is. But it says this very specific thing that happens over a very narrow range of physical conditions is happening here. And that is an incredible opportunity to test all of the various pieces of physics that goes into that, right? So it's things like that that I think will give us the ability to make progress in places where you know, we have lots of moving parts, but we have to hit this one specific thing has to happen. Okay, and finally, I want to uh, advocate parameter variations, always. So in, as we go and we add more sophisticated, more detailed approaches to models, uh, it's, I think, really worth our time to twiddle with the other parameters and the other knobs as we do that. To be really honest with ourselves and the community about how sensitive this new thing we added is in comparison to the uncertainties that are already there. And also what it does is it allows us to find a place on the HR diagram where we're pretty insensitive to the uncertainties we don't really care about, and we are maximally sensitive to this new thing that we want to test. Right? So doing these parameter variations, being really careful about the systematics, being cognizant of all of the uncertainty that we carry with us in each new investigation that we do will help us to make faster progress, I think, on a lot of these problems. Okay, so with that, I'm going to Leave it there, take questions, and we can start discussion. All right, thank you, Dan, for an amazing talk. Are there any questions already? Yep. Thanks. Uh, just to start off, we had a uh, clarifying question from uh, Corinne who asked about the helium enrichment laws. Yeah. Uh, why do they not all start with uh, a primordial? Um, 
BBN uh, uh, values for helium. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, which one is that? That's different. Actually, does anyone, does somebody, DCEP people here know this answer without me trying to guess what choice was made in DCEP? Because that's that's the one that's mostly different. That specifically right? is the question. It's basically why why does this why is this not at twenty four? Why is this up at twenty eight? It might just be the the like you you pick a slope and you pick some reference points and it might just be that one of the reference points wasn't the primordial one. I'm not actually sure, unfortunately. I mean I know that we use pretty outdated abundances and scaling in general. Um, but I don't know that any of the others on this plot are, are using the AO9 for sure. Yeah. But that's one reason for differences recently. Mm. Meredith, also, hello. <laughs> Five people run DSEP. I'm one of them. <laughs> any other questions? Um, yeah. Hi. So regarding your last point, oh, sorry, I'm Mathieu again. So um, regarding your last point of tens testing the sensitivity to free parameters, I agree that this is super important, but how do you deal with models that don't converge numerically, like models that can't evolve basically with the certain choices, which is the typical situation I find myself in? Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's actually not a situation I've typically run into because I run solar models, which almost always converge, right? Uh, I think, um, I mean, I think the problem, I, th I think you should always be doing parameter variations. And if the issue is, is that you can't get convergence on some set of parameters, you have to do, I guess my recommendation would be careful work to look at whether that failure to converge is something that you, you just, you're never going to be able to get that model to converge because it's not going to work, in which case you can, rule out that particular variation in that direction, right? If you can never get it to work, or if it's a numerical thing, you have to spend some time figuring numerically out how you're gonna go about doing that variation. But I think, I think, uh, I think even when there are challenges in actually getting the models to run, it's, it's worth spending the time to be able to get them to run in these varied parameter sets so that you know what your sensitivity is. Maybe if you give me more details about the problem, actually the audience more details about the problem, they could. They could. Sure, so I, I agree that it's super important. I spent most of my time doing it. I'm not sure I agree that if the model can't get through, that rules it out in nature though, because in our models we do lots of stuff that nature doesn't need to do, okay. like resolution and stuff like that. So one example was, changing the efficiency of meridional circulations in an accretor in a binary would make it impossible to go past the row slope overflow phase and the accretion phase, while with certain, with certain values I can, with certain other values I can't, and after months of playing with that, I kind of describe what I have and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, have, a, <laughs> I don't have a good answer for you other than that. The, even, even the act of saying I've tried twiddle, I've tried moving this around and I get into numerical trouble if I move it too much is a useful statement to make, right? It tells you that you should be aware that the numerics might be important here in a way that they are not always important in other, other places of where you're looking at stellar evolution. Thanks. Uh, this is Adrian, and maybe this is a naive question, kind of piggybacking off of that. Uh, I come from the, you know, 3D hydro simulation side of things, where one of the knobs that you should always uh, check for when reviewing a paper is, did they do convergence testing and look at uh, time step and stuff like that? And I wonder if that's part yeah. of what you were referencing when you talked about knobs. And I wonder, I, I, it's a sincere yes. question. Is that a standard practice? So, no, uh, actually. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, and, okay. and, all the all the Mesa devs in the room are like cheering you on because this is this is you know especially when you have a public code like Mesa where the community is using it right you you, you can't necessarily rely on the fact that the the defaults are going to be the right default for the problem that you're doing so what you should always do is 
tune the time step knobs, right, and the, the mesh knobs in your code, and make sure you don't get a different answer when you make things more precise, right? Um, that's an important convergence thing to do. And you'll see it more and more these days in papers, especially those that use Mesa because it's been so strongly advocated by the Mesa devs, um, that this kind of convergence test is done. When I talk about knobs, I also mean things like uh, when you can swap out the opacity table and see if it makes a difference, right? It's a little unsatisfying because you only have like two options, right? And if both options are wrong, it's not really telling you very much. Uh, but it's better than nothing. Right, so when you have a chance to swap out some set of ingredients, swap the set of ingredients. When you have some tunable parameter like overshooting or, con or uh, alpha, move that around. But also do these careful convergence tests to make sure that you are not fooling yourself and that numerically everything is sound as well. We have a Zoom question from Pascal Garreau. Uh, uh, could, could you summarize what are the latest results on the solar abundance problem? The latest results in the solar abundance problem are like 2021 papers. Um, there's a, an update from Asplund, and there's a paper by Maria Bergman measuring the solar abundance, and it puts it about halfway, halfway between the original high value and the, new, the Asplund low value. Um, it comes from incorporating uh, both 3D, non-LTE, and it's more complex 3D simulations. There's like beautiful 3D sims in these solar oxygen papers. Um, it also, there's also uh, an ongoing discussion about the neon. So neon actually enters into the solar oxygen problem because it also is an important opacity source at the base of the convection zone. It's a noble gas, so it's pretty hard to measure. Uh, and the ways we have of measuring it are uncertain by factors of a few. Uh, so if you bump up the neon abundance, which the recent Asplund paper did, uh, and you play with neon's opacity, you can also kind of get yourself out of some of the problems. So that's like kind of where we stand. The abundances have kind of crept up over time, both oxygen and neon. And the opacities have, if they look like they're going to go one direction, it looks like they're going to go higher opacity, which also set, re, would resolve the problem, right? You need either more of the stuff or you need the stuff to be more opaque to, to solve the issue. Uh, this is Evan Anders. I just have a quick clarifying question on the second to last slide, I think. So you showed these like wiggly stars and like observations that match them, but yes. I'm really bad at understanding how observations match models because I don't do them. So can you point out like what on the plot yeah, yeah. So, shows that? So what's happening here right, is you're getting, you have things that if you didn't have this instability happening, you would just have a smooth feature, a smooth curve here, right? And the instability is causing this kind of sawtoothy pattern. So it's moving you out of a certain radius and luminosity place where you would ex expected stars to be. So in this, this gap is because stars that should have been there were pushed out because they're doing one of these sawtooth things. And the bigger the sawtooth, the more obvious the gap would be, right? So the, it, Greg did a beautiful job in this paper. Uh, he, he argues that the, the stars mostly causing this gap are the ones that are doing the big sawtooths because it's the, it clears it out the most and it gives you the, the, the cleanest, sharpest edges to this. Does that answer your question? Possibly. So, so you're saying a gap? Is there like a place where stars are less dense on that plot? My yes. might just. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I thought it so was the width of that. I actually don't have. In the model, you can see it much cleaner. It's right there. Okay. So it's 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 subtle, but it's there. It's like a thirty percent decrement in the number of stars. So it's not it's not an empty gap, which it shouldn't be, uh, but it it is definitely there. That's cool. Thanks. This is Jim Fuller. So Jen, you mentioned the problem of gravitational settling, which especially in stars more massive than the sun, is one area where the models can make predictions that are not wrong by 10%, but they're wrong by orders of magnitude in terms of surface abundances. Yes. So I was just curious about your perspective. You know, we, we know we need some extra mixing in those stars, but what's your perspective on the physical mechanisms of that extra mixing that and, extra and how it can be modeled? in stellar evolution codes. Yeah. I think that is a better question for massive star modelers in the audience. Does anybody want to take it? Like I said, I only briefly do forays up in the upper main sequence. I'm only talking 1.3 solar masses. I'm not asking <laughs> you to go still, too far. That's still kind of, I mean, okay. So it, 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 I think there's no consensus on, on what the best mechanism 
is, right? It needs to be some, they, they're rotating fast. It's probably related to rotation. The details of, of what instability would cause the mixing in that rapidly rotating system, I think, is, is not something I have the answer to. But I think it's, it's got to be connected to the change in rotation rate, right? That's the most obvious thing. But that's a very, I know it's an unsatisfactory answer to your question. Okay, a uh, Zoom question from uh, Corinne Charbonnel. Uh, are there any astroseismic clues on the variation of, F of alpha MLT along evolution? Yes, definitely. There's been a couple, I'm trying, I don't think these people are in the audience. If you are and I haven't seen you, raise your hand. No, okay. So there are astroseismic clues. Um, the one of them comes from, uh, that plot I showed in the beginning, which is from Jamie. So these are stars with astroseismic masses. Uh, and it's because you know the mass that you're able to tell the difference between these different tracks. And if you have a metallicity dependent mixing length, you can actually make these tracks map onto that pattern that you see better. There's been investigations in uh, main sequence and subgiant branch stars trying to look at what alpha needs to be, because when you have the seismology, your problem is a whole lot more constrained than it is for the average star. So you actually can get a constraint on what alpha needs to be. Usually you, you, you can also get a constraint on helium. There's things that wiggle around and there's degeneracies that you worry about, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see the general trend of it is, is that you expect there, there looks like there's a surface gravity dependence to the mixing length when you look at main sequence and subgiant branch stars with astroseismology and that there is a um, uh, metallicity dependence when you look at the, the giant branch stars. The, the kind of disturbing thing about it is, is that most of the seismic results all agree in the kind of the sense of how the alpha needs to be changed as a function of evolutionary state and surface properties. And then if you look at the 3D sims, they, they don't predict the same trend in how alpha needs to be changed. And so there's a really interesting tension there. They both, they, like, everybody agrees that these things should matter. They just disagree on the sense of it, which I think is, is an opportunity for lots of new things to, <laughs> an opportunity for work to be done. Uh, hi, yes, now. Okay, Vicky Antoji here. So I would like to comment uh, on Jim's question concerning gravitational settling. Go for it in A-type stars, what we can do is actually from the observational point of view to look at the AM stars, right? Which are uh, basically exactly those stars where we know that the rotation is very slow. So the rotation cannot be the, the mixing process that, that is going on there. We know from observations that, uh, or actually from models, that helium has to settle because it's through gravitational settling which means that all those stars should not be pulsating because it's the, the way it's understood is that the kappa mechanism um, operating in the helium ionization layer is exciting those modes. Nevertheless, we see a lot of them um, uh, pulsating. And actually, I think what's going on is that we have a different mechanism that excites these pulsations. So, and that is connected to the hydrogen ionization layer and the turbulent pressure mechanism where you do not require as much helium to, to be there. This does not solve your, or does not maybe directly answer a question how we can change the models, because I don't know, but we can use these stars to test our models. The AM stars, are they, they're all magnetic as well? Strongly magnetic? Well, no, uh, these are the AP stars. <laughs> okay. Very okay, different yeah, numbers. So the AP, the M stands for metallic, not for magnetic. Ah, uh, okay, right, right. Right, Thank I you. know it's for historical reasons. <laughs> But there are some stars that may have, you know, magnetic fields of the order of 10 Gauss, but not really strong magnetic no, fields. Not. The ones with the strong magnetic fields um, are the AP stars. Uh, Lars Bildson here. So, so Jen, I think I totally am excited by your future prospects with Gaia and with astroseismology. I'd love to hear what your comments are about the future of the sun. Um, you know, are there data we're expecting to get on the sun that's going to also 
be new and exciting in any dimension for this challenge you've so well described? Uh, so in the context, I'm going to, so Dekist is coming online. The solar people have told me it's going to be fantastic, but it's mostly fantastic for very near surface things. So thinking about, um, let me think for a moment. So for the deep interior, I don't like we, we're out of modes for a helio seismology. That's not going to get better, basically. Uh, I think I think the place where progress will be will be made has to basically come from the modeling side. I think more sophisticated approaches to modeling, measuring the atmospheric properties, because that's a big lingering uncertainty. And I think that's the, the data for that aren't changing. It's just our modeling approach is getting more sophisticated. So that's, that's where I see progress being made as a people add layers of sophistication to those models. You get a clearer and sharper picture. I think uh, the opportunity to actually do lab tests of opacities is an astoundingly powerful thing to actually have that nailed down. So I have a lot of hope about the direction that that will go. It's a slow process. You only get to fire this thing like once a day, right? And there's lots of teams that want to use it. So it's going to be a, a, a slow accumulation. Um, but I think that's a place where you can, you can do a nicer job. And then the, the other remaining place, like I mentioned for this, um, for this picture here, Right. I mentioned that this is probably mixing, right? This is, this is right below the convection zone. This is a bump that comes, we think, from an overabundance of helium that's right below. If you do a standard diffusive model, it kind of piles up down there. And if you add a little bit of extra mixing, it, it kind of breaks you in some other spots, but it does a better job of reproducing this. And so the data are there, and I don't think the data will get better. But our prescriptions for exactly how we treat mixing, maybe taking a, a more sophisticated approach to what the 3D picture would look like, might allow you to finally resolve like some of these issues in this region that's right near the boundary. So I think I think the answer comes from the theory side for how we do much better on the sun and getting more sophisticated in our approaches there. But that would be my take on it. Uh, Radek Smolets here. When comparing uh, observations to evolutionary tracks, I think uh, a big problem is related to metallicity. From observations, we have Fe over H, which is quite often given in some specific metallicity scale, there are a few on the market. Uh, and it is a measure of iron content, uh, surface iron content at, at a given evolutionary stage. While for evolutionary track, we need a bulk initial composition uh, expressed through uh, hydrogen, helium, and metal content. Uh, so what's your procedure to make this translation between Fe over H and X, Y, and Z and what's your estimate of associated uncertainties related to that? Yeah, so I could tell you the, the procedure that we generally use uh, is the wrong one, <laughs> or just assume the pattern is solar. So whatever the solar pattern is, you measure Fe upon H, and you assume that everything tracks in the same way. Uh, that's generally what people do. There are uh, tables that allow for like an alpha enhanced abundance pattern. Right, and the place, if you go, if you're going to go into your stellar model and say, okay, I want to use a, an abundance pattern that is not the sun's, there is a, ser a cascade of things that you need to change and be careful about changing to do the mapping correctly. You need to change the atmosphere boundary condition. Generally, those atmosphere models are not actually produced in the abundance ratios you'd like, so you're kind of stuck in some cases there. You need to change the opacity tables. Those are really important. That's the biggest one you need to be careful of because the, the exact mixture of metals is really important for opacity. That's relatively easy to do. There's ways to go online and recompute the opacity tables with your new mixture, thanks to the opacity folks being aware and cognizant of the, the, the need to do this. Um, you should also probably change your equation of state. It's a little bit harder to do. The equation of state usually only takes Z, not a detailed abundance. So you're inheriting a couple of places where you can't do it as well as you would like, but the really big important one is the opacity, and there you can do a decent job. So if you're careful and you go through and you, you specify the pattern, you can actually do the mapping in the right way in your model. 
It's more possible to know the pattern as the spectroscopy has gotten better these days and you have the detailed abundances. You could actually imagine saying, I have a star with these surface abundances. I'm going to go look at this pattern as I model it. People are not usually doing that because there's so many steps to actually go from that detailed abundance pattern to, to a correct model for it. But it is, in principle, something you could do. Does that answer your question? Mostly, kind of? Kind of. We can <laughs> discuss later. Do you want to you rephrase the, the bit that I didn't get? And maybe I can answer that. Can you, can you estimate the, the uncertainty? My, my worry is that this uncertainty limits our ability to, to constrain other physical parameters uh, that, that enter evolutionary calculations. Uh, let's see. Uh, e... Just like, like, like you have a globular cluster of a given Fe over H, and you want to compute isochrons, right? So uh, for, for, for evolutionary tracks, you, you, you don't really provide this Fe over H, you provide X, Y, and Z. Yeah, you provide Z. Uh, at initial uh, pre-main sequence stage, and then kind of bulk uh, physical composition, right? So you don't take into account possible changes to surface uh, chemical composition. Uh, and of course, when, when, when doing this translation, you need to assume um, solar abundance, right? Uh, so I guess, my guess is that there is a large uncertainty related just to this translation. I think uh, some fraction of it is for sure. I think it's right to be concerned about the translation and to be very specific about what you mean by Z versus a metallicity, because we do often just assume the solar pattern and it can be significant, especially if elements that are very important for the interior physics, like oxygen, are very different. Um, I think it's not, it's not the leading order effect for, for in many of these cases, like the mixing length changes and the overshooting give you a much starker uh, difference, at least for sunlight stars on the main sequence, caveat there. Uh, the, the difference is much more stark. But I think if you're pushing towards that 0.01 dex, 10K, like really, really finely tuned regime, you absolutely need to worry about what your pattern is. And we generally do not. Thank you. Uh, so we have two minutes left. Is there a short question? Is that a short one? <laughs> so Rafa Garcia from C exactly. Um, so going into what Lars asked for the sun, there is still a lot of job to be done. So we have to improve inversions. We have to improve, I mean, improve the way in which we use the high from a from seismology point of view, uh, how we combine the data. So we have 25 years of data, more than that, right now. But we have to mix the different instruments. We're working on that. It's not completely done yet. Uh, of course, we have to go into the G modes, uh, individual ones. So for that, we have to beat the convection no noise. Yeah. So we need a new uh, generation of instruments. Uh, so there is still a lot of, of things to be, to be Thank done. Thank you for keeping me honest, Rafa. I should have said G modes. <laughs> Thank you. And there was another one in Zoom, Daniel. Yeah, uh, a uh, question from Zoom. Well, um, especially since we're on this slide, uh, there was uh, from, so uh, Pascal Garreau mentioned that um, uh, the biggest problem is the position of the convection zone. Yeah. Once you know what that is, then you can start thinking about the Takahain mixing. Yeah. There's a follow-up from uh, uh, Tanda Lee uh, uh, asking uh, if there are any promising models for attack client mixing that can be used in 1D stellar modeling. That's a question for the audience. Anybody have any promising attack client mixing models? Maybe not. So uh, in terms of, you know, just the, the position of the solar convection zone is known really well. It's 0. 0.0003 solar radii uncertainty on it. It's like really well known. Getting the models to match it is a different story. But the, 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 the goal post is super clear. Um, that's the only commentary I can add to, to that particular line. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's great because we're done with the questions and we can continue this discussion with uh, during coffee. Let's thank Chen again for an amazing talk.